Podcast, proudly sponsored by Hollis Wright and Couch, are here to serve you. Your tough legal questions answered by our experts, the attorneys with Josh Wright from the Hollis Wright and Couch Law Firm and host David Lamb. Hello and welcome into the attorneys. We appreciate you being with us tonight. For the next half hour, we're going to talk with Jefferson County's district attorney, answer some of the questions that probably you always wanted to know. We're going to quiz him for sure, but uh, appreciate your involvement in it. You can call, text, or email us all throughout the program. That information will be on your screen. Joined again, uh, as we are often, by Josh Wright of the firm Hollis Wright & Couch. Hope you had a great week. It did, sir. Um, sir. As is the case, we often bring on some just great guests, uh, and, and today is no exception. Uh, we've got uh, District Attorney Brandon Falls um, on the show. We're honored to have him on the show, and we're going to be answering some questions and explaining a little bit about the role that the District Attorney actually plays and the important role that it plays in, in uh, our local uh, area here in Jefferson County. Um, Brandon, uh, thank you for being on our show, first of all. Thank I know, you for having me. Uh, as I recall, you uh, were appointed in 2008 and then ran in 2010 to a six-year term. You were elected as our district attorney here in yes, Jefferson County. that is correct. Tell the viewers, just so they get an idea, people here, this is the district attorney, but what does the district attorney do kind of in, in our area? Well, the primary duty of the DA's office is prosecute the, the felony cases. So. I'd say about 99% of what we do is going to be criminal cases. It's going to be misdemeanors and felonies, the things that you hear about in the news, unfortunately. Murder cases, robbery cases, the sexual assault cases. That's our primary focus. How big is the district attorney's office, a number of lawyers? How, how does that, how does it uh, structure? We have uh, 43 attorneys okay. and about 50 support staff. Okay. It's a big, it's a big yeah, group. I mean, you don't realize that that much muscle is behind the district attorney's office in Jefferson County. Yeah, you, you don't. And, and there are, what's interesting about tonight's show is that there are questions that I think most of us have mm -hmm. or things we hear, terms we hear yeah. that you're going to help us understand. Yeah, but but it's, it's interesting to me. What is, what is your, what is your background and what, what is normally the background of a district attorney? Well, my background, I can't speak for everyone, but uh, my background was, was with the DA's office. Mm -hmm. I graduated law school in 1997. Uh, started uh, with the with the DA's office in October of '97, so I'm coming up on 15 years in the office. So I was a prosecutor in the office, uh, and with the DA's office, uh, you you often jump right in. And so I was handling cases, robbery cases, and drug cases pretty quick when I started. Mm -hmm. um, came up through the office doing that, prosecuting cases over the years in different uh, four different judges in Jefferson County. Uh, eventually became a supervisor in the office, and so I was. I was teaching younger prosecutors, supervising them, working with them on their cases, and then uh, when my predecessor, David Barber, retired, I was appointed by the governor to fill his term. You know, the, the, one, the one stop in between there is uh, Chief Deputy, right. uh, who's the, the head of the attorneys in our office, uh, which I've often said is the, the best job you can have. <laughs> uh, I overshot it just a little bit by, by becoming the uh, does uh, does the uh, in your role now as the the, the chief uh, and head DA uh, in Jefferson County, uh, are you still actively involved in trying cases, or does that fall in uh, as a responsibility of uh, the other DAs in the office? Unfortunately, I don't get to try as many cases as I like. I've told my my assistant DAs many times that we have different jobs now. Um, my role now is mainly as administrator in the office with an office at large. And with a budget of, uh, you know, depending on the year, somewhere around $7 million, I've got the responsibility to make sure that the office is operating, make sure that state and county are properly funding us, and, and making sure that, uh, that all my employees have a job mm -hmm. and have and a I, paycheck. And, and David, I know as, as I do some lobbying work down in Montgomery um, uh, with, with, uh, on behalf of some of our lawyers in the state, uh, uh, the district attorney falls is, is there also and is active politically in working with the legislature and whatnot for funding purposes and budgeting right. and so he's got a he wears a bunch of hats there's a lot no on doubt the plate. about that yeah yes now, there are many days I say I'd love to take a stack of files and head up to court mm -hmm. there are a couple of cases that I, that I, I do stay, stay active in uh, but you know just because you work a case up and, and get it ready doesn't mean, mean you're necessarily going to go to trial one that I was handling recently pled guilty the, the the day of trial so gotcha. sometimes how, that can seem like a lot of work for, for I've wondered I think our, our viewers probably do how does Jefferson County from a crime perspective stack up to other metropolitan areas I mean do we 
Are we, are we doing pretty good with the number of crimes and the way we prosecute those crimes? Yes. How, how do we stack up? I, I'd say we're doing pretty good. Uh, but uh, the city of Birmingham is where we get most of our most of our cases, and unfortunately, the city of Birmingham uh, just consistently stays in the top ten as far as uh, homicides and violent crime, and that's something that we're working working on right now. I've assigned an attorney to uh, to start a project that's often called community prosecution, and really what it is is working more closely with. Uh, with the police department, he's working right now closely with the with the uh, West Precinct, with Birmingham Police Department. See what we can do to make sure those numbers come down. Yeah. Let, let's go over some of the terms that we hear all the time, just to to make sure. One of the things about about this show is we we cover some things that uh, second nature to you, but I think folks hear them and don't know exactly uh, exactly what they mean. First of all, what is the grand jury? Grand jury. That's the big mystery. Um, a grand jury is just 18 jurors that are picked from the jury pool, and they serve for three months. That's the biggest surprise to them. They serve uh, one week a month for three months, and that's their grand jury term. And what they're doing is they are hearing all the cases that are going to be heading towards trial. So in Alabama, before any felony case can be tried, a grand jury has to issue an indictment, which is just a formal charging instrument that says, we, the people of Jefferson County, charge John Smith with this crime. Mm -hmm. uh, during that week, they will hear somewhere around 300 cases. So we move, uh, move witnesses through pretty quickly, and they get a good, a good snapshot of what's going on throughout the county, and are often very surprised at, at what is going on. But uh, they are really the gatekeepers. They're the ones that are saying, yes, this is a, uh, there is probable cause. Uh, that's their primary determination. Is there probable cause in this case? And, and really saying, is this something that, that, that should be prosecuted? Uh, they're looking at the law, but, but sometimes they're looking at, at a case and saying, saying we as uh, the people of Jefferson County want or don't want this case right. prosecuted. You, you just used a term, all of the loyal um, law and order view, viewers for uh, years on uh, Alabama's 13 uh, have heard the term probable cause. Yes. What is probable cause? Okay, probable cause basically is um, enough facts and circumstances, enough evidence to lead a reasonable person to believe that a crime has been committed. And that's the, the standard in Alabama for a, a warrant to be issued against someone charging them with a crime. And it's also the standard that's used for a, a police officer or a sheriff's deputy to get a search warrant to go and uh, search someone's house or search someone's property. Mm -hmm. One thing that I, I think uh, you know, we, we've touched on with other shows um, is how the discovery process in a criminal case is different from that of a civil case, significantly different. Once probable cause is established uh, in the chronology of a case, it moves into more of a discovery phase, but it's fairly limited, is it not? Yes, in the, in the, in the criminal area, uh, discovery is kind of one-sided. Uh, it's, it's a matter of us providing to an attorney for someone charged with a crime uh, all the information about our case. However, in Alabama, there's very little that, uh, that the defense has to provide to the prosecution. So uh, sometimes we are finding out what the defense is going to be, literally, when an attorney stands up and makes his opening statement in trial, and sometimes not even then, not until we get into the meat of the case. Explain for us, if you will, um, and, and you just raised a, an interesting uh, issue. The district attorney has an ethical and a legal obligation to provide all of the evidence that you have um, to counsel for the defendant and to the defendant to be able to defend themselves, do you not? Right. It almost right. kind of puts you at a disadvantage to start with in some respects. Well, uh, only at a disadvantage in terms of, of not knowing what the defense is going to be in the case. Gotcha. Uh, really, if, if we don't believe that, the, that a defendant charged with a crime actually committed that crime, we have an ethical duty not to bring the case, not to prosecute the case. So we, under the Alabama Rules of Criminal Procedure, and then under U.S. Supreme Court rulings, there are certain, certain things that we have to give over. Of course, any evidence that shows that, uh, that a defendant did not commit the crime, that, right off the bat, that has to be given over. But any statements, uh, any uh, tests that are done by the Department of Forensic Sciences, that, that we have to give over. And really, DA's offices across the country are moving more towards what's called open file discovery and just saying here, here is everything, yeah. so that there's not going to be any question 
uh, about the conviction itself on right. the back end. All right. Time for our first break. As we head to break, a reminder that we'd love to hear from you. You can call, text, or email us uh, on the information that you see, see there. You can also find the firm of Hollis Wright and Couch if you'll search the uh, firm name on Facebook. Find them on Twitter as well, Hollis underscore Wright. Uh, stay tuned. More of the attorneys coming right up. I'm Josh Wright with the law firm of Hollis Wright and & Couch, and thanks for watching The Attorneys on Alabama's 13. Now, we hope you, a friend, or a loved one never need legal counsel for a case. But if you do, the goal of the show is simple. Provide answers and legal counsel when you need it the most. Your call to the show is free, so if you have questions specific to this show or related to other civil legal matters, call, email, or text us to talk with one of our lawyers. You can also follow us on Facebook or Twitter to learn about important legal news that could affect you or your family. Or simply contact us by going to alabamas13.com and click on the attorney's link. We know your time is valuable, so thank you for spending it with us and for watching the attorneys right here on Alabama's 13. Welcome back into the attorney sponsored by the firm of Hollis Wright and Couch. Uh, our guest tonight, Josh Wright of the firm Hollis Wright and Couch, as well as Brandon Falls, Jefferson County's district attorney. Uh, a, a lot of education, a lot of good terms and, and terminology helping us understand uh, what we so often hear on the news. Uh, a question here, how is the district attorney's office different from the U.S. attorney's office? Well, the U.S. attorney's office prosecutes criminal cases on the federal level. So you have, okay. you have an Alabama state code, Alabama criminal laws, and then you have the uh, federal code with federal criminal laws. Uh, they also handle a lot more civil work uh, on behalf of the United States as opposed to the DA's office has so the, att the Attorney General's office, which handles most of the civil work on behalf of the state. Okay. Whenever, um, help us kind of walk through the steps. Whenever we hear of a crime, if you hear of a crime being committed on the news in Jefferson County, mm -hmm. how is that, um, how is that case assigned and, and kind of what steps begin then? Well, usually what happens is when the, when the detective feels like he has probable cause, he's got enough information to charge someone with a crime, he comes and sits down with us and we go ahead and, and get all that information and put it into our, our case management system. Now the cases are assigned randomly to a district court judge and district court is the first level in the criminal justice process where there are preliminary hearings for cases. Case goes from district court to grand jury to circuit court and circuit court is trial court. That's where you, you have your trials. Within our office, uh, we, we try to assign the homicide cases, the sexual assault cases to an attorney as soon as we can when it walks in the door. The, the criminal justice system in Jefferson County, the criminal courts. Uh, Jefferson County is unique in this state in that we have judges who just do civil and we have judges who just do criminal. And what we're working on right now with the judges is a track system uh, where that case, uh, where certain cases would be assigned to a circuit court judge as soon as they come in, as, as soon as a, a warrant is issued. And uh, that judge would keep it throughout the process. In other words, it wouldn't go to a district court judge, it would go to a circuit court judge mm -hmm. who would do a lot of the same things with the case. Now what that will allow us to do is assign those cases to the attorney who's assigned to that court. So take uh, uh, you know, Judge Jones or uh, Judge Petro. We have attorneys assigned to those judges' courtrooms. And with this new system, what we're hoping to be able to do is when that case walks in the door, go ahead and assign it to those, those prosecutors in that courtroom, and they'll keep it throughout the process. Now that, that sounds simple, but it's so important for the case to have a prosecutor working it from day one, right. to really make those decisions that need to be made about uh, uh, subpoenas, about further information that needs to be investigated in the case. Mm -hmm. Go out and talk to other witnesses, find other witnesses. And for us, for me, that means we're going to be better prepared for that, that case when it reaches trial because it may be eight months to a year before a criminal case actually reaches trial. Mm -hmm. David, it's, it's interesting. Uh, a lot of times <clears throat> we will, on the civil side, be working with the district attorney that is assigned to a specific case. 
because not only are there criminal implications uh, associated with wrongful conduct, but there may be some civil Im implications. The, the easiest example is a drunk driver, um, where you've got a drunk driver that may yeah. be criminally prosecuted, um, and there also may be a civil context uh, related to a dram shop case. We, we've talked about dram yeah. shop mm -hmm. cases on the show before. And um, there is an interplay between counsel on the civil side for the victim, uh, as well as the district attorney, and the interplay really is a, you know, allow the district attorney to do his job and complete his job um, before you get really active in your civil case. That's generally the way that it works right. so that the DA is able to do what they're supposed to do without having to worry about a civil case being filed that could impact a plea deal yeah. or a potential resolution on the criminal side. And so not only are they working the case, but they're also working with other counsel that may be collaterally involved in potential civil implications. And that makes it even more complicated to be a district attorney. Man. Um, another question that uh, we got in, uh, if I am a victim of a crime, is the district attorney's office my lawyer? Not necessarily, no. Uh, everyone in my office, me, all of my assistant DAs, we have one client, and that's the state of Alabama. Okay. And so we represent the state in the prosecution of a defendant for commission of a crime. Now we t factor in the, what a victim wants to see happen with the case. But we also do that with the detectives. We look at the criminal history of the person that's charged with the crime, we look at the facts, and make a determination as to what, what results should happen, what is going to be justice in this case. Now you might have a case where a victim comes in and, and their uh, dad's watch that they, in, they inherited from him was stolen, and they want the, the burglar, the thief, to go to prison for the rest of his life. Right. That's not just going to, that, that's not going to happen. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're trying to make sure that a just resolution of the case is reached. And sometimes a victim wants, well, a victim doesn't necessarily understand uh, the law, doesn't understand the sentencing process, and doesn't understand uh, what, to, what goes into making those decisions to, uh, to reach a plea agreement in the case. Uh, that's our job. Right. And, and, and our job is to do that on behalf of the state, not only to punish the, the criminal for committing the crime, but also to send a message to the rest of the community that this can't happen. This, right. this is not going to happen without some, some repercussions. Mm -hmm. uh, a question we get a lot, uh, and I'd like to pose it to you. Um, somebody will say, I've got something happening in my community. I'm seeing it consistently. Uh, I think it violates the law. Um, under those circumstances, um, a lot of times the question will be, can I call the district attorney's office? And the advice we generally provide is, you probably need to call law enforcement first. I mean, it isn't calling the district attorney's office getting the cart before the horse sometimes on, on those type issues? It can be. Okay. It can be. Uh, we're always happy to take those calls, but we are going to then direct them to law enforcement. Got it. And it really depends on the situation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're happy to hear about what's going on. We're happy that people are concerned and want to better their communities, and we want to help them get to the right agency, whether that's police department, sheriff's office, or maybe a state, another state agency that needs to investigate that situation. Good stuff. Time for our uh, second break here of the attorneys. <laughs> As we head to break, just want to remind you, get in touch with us. You can call, text, email the show. Also, find the firm of Hollis Wright & Couch. If you'll search the firm name on Facebook or Hollis underscore Wright to find them on Twitter. Stay tuned. Our final segment of the attorneys coming right up. From all of us at the law firm of Hollis, Wright & Couch, we're glad to have you here with us every Sunday night on Alabama's 13. This week we're talking with the Jefferson County District Attorney's Office and discussing the role of that office. The District Attorney's Office reviews the facts and evidence of a reported crime. After the case is approved by the District Attorney's Office, if it is, it goes to the grand jury, which decides if there is probable cause. If so, the case will likely go to trial unless there is a plea deal before a trial takes place. The DA's office is part of the criminal justice system, but the events that created the criminal case may also be prosecuted through a civil claim. If you have questions about whether a criminal case can also be prosecuted in civil court, you may want to consult a civil lawyer. Please remember your call, email, or text to the attorneys is free. All of us at Hollis Wright & Couch want to help you answer your questions on real issues you face in your life. Remember, a competent lawyer will respond to every question you send in. 
That's our pledge and promise to you, the viewer. Thanks for watching the attorneys right here on Alabama's 13. Welcome back into our final segment of the attorney's time. Enough for you to get your uh, information, your question called or texted or uh, emailed to us. Uh, wrapping up uh, our, our final segment here with Brandon Falls, District Attorney of Jefferson County. A question that we've got in, if I am a victim of a crime, is there any limitation on when a criminal suit may be brought to address the harm? Yes, there is. Uh, normally, statute of limitations, and that's what... That's a period of time that, uh, in, in which a, a case has to be filed. Uh, generally, it's three years. However, for violent crimes, uh, for murder, for sexual assault, there is no statute of limitations. Right. And, um, misdemeanor cases, things that uh, maybe assault third degree, a disorderly conduct or harassment charge, that's uh, that has to be filed within 12 months. Okay, and and you you bring up some that reminds me of a case that's in the news now, the Jerry Sandusky case yes. uh, in Penn State. Is is that an example of what you're talking about? How something that happened, I mean, that happened several years ago. Right. Right. Yeah. Yes. Uh, certainly, with uh, with cases involving child victims, you don't want to put a statute of limitations. You don't want to put a limitation on that. Uh, a child, you know, nine, ten. 10 years old or even younger who's a victim of crime may not feel comfortable coming forward with that until they reach adulthood. Mm -hmm. And we've seen that several times. We've seen folks come back and, and look back and, at what happened to them and, and they were too young really to know what to do about it right. and come back. And, and it's, of course, it's difficult to start that investigation later, but uh, you, you worry about what else that uh, right. perpetrator, that uh, violator has done and uh, you, you, you don't want to close the door on, on uh, bringing justice in that case. For, for minors um, and parents that may be cautious about um, uh, bringing something to light, are there uh, protections in place with the district attorney's office and law enforcement to protect those minors um, from asserting allegations that, that are accurate allegations but they're concerned to assert? There are, there are. It, it really depends on whether that case goes to trial or not. Okay. Uh, witnesses often, victims of crime, often want to just give a deposition or give a statement, uh, which is fine. That's, that's absolutely necessary to, to begin the investigation into the crime. But when a case reaches trial, a, a defendant uh, charged with a crime does have a right of confrontation. So there has to be some testimony in front of a jury given at trial. And that, that really does scare a lot of folks, uh, cause them pause to think about, do I really want to go through this? and, and and uh, put my child or put myself through this. But the, the truth is that um, about 95% of the cases, maybe as high as 97% of the cases, reach a plea agreement and never do go to trial. And that's true in DA's offices across the country. Uh, we, we get about 7,000 felony cases a year, and with eight criminal judges, uh, not every case is gonna be, is gonna be tried. Yeah. So we do reach plea agreements in most cases and uh, then uh, try the rest. Geez, 7,000. Um, what a question, another question we've got in here, um, and we've dealt with this before, but I think it's important. Uh, what's the difference, and as best as you can define it, the difference between civil and criminal law? Well, civil law looks to uh, compensate someone for a wrong. Uh, criminal law looks to punish someone and uh, send a message to the community that, uh, that the crime is, is not going to be tolerated. So. Again, we're representing the state, mm -hmm. and it's the state's position, uh, the, the, the state against right. the person charged with the crime. In a mm -hmm. civil case, um, an attorney files a lawsuit on behalf of someone, and they're really looking to, to make them whole for whatever is, has happened to them. Right. Yeah, and the, you know, the, the burdens of proof are totally different. We've talked about this on some other shows. The burden is much higher in a criminal case from that of a civil case. Maybe the greatest example that the viewers would know about is the O.J. Simpson case where O.J. is found not guilty of committing a crime, yet he is found guilty or liable, if you will, under the civil case by the Goldman family for um, the wrongful death of their son. Right. And so that's just one of many examples out there. You know, what we see on our end, uh, more than anything, where the criminal context and the civil context cross, 
um, is sexual assault cases where we are hired by a family related to some sexual assault and there's a criminal context and there's also a civil implication mm -hmm. um, and uh, also drunk driving accidents. That's probably, those are the two biggest things that we see where there's an interplay between the district attorney's office and the criminal law and that of the civil law. All right. Uh, we have uh, about a minute and a half left, uh, time enough for uh, a final thought from you uh, as uh, you know, with, with our viewers, just something that you would like to leave them with. Sure. You know, whenever I speak to groups of, of citizens in Jefferson County, I let them know that, that we can't do anything without their help. Right. I mean, we're here to um, oftentimes clean up at the end uh, of, of a terrible situation and look for justice in, in a situation that um, is so bleak. Yeah. But we can't do anything without witnesses. We can't do anything without that citizen making the phone call to law enforcement or the phone call to us to let us know when they see a crime, when they know of something happening. And we don't make Jefferson County any better unless we work together to do that. It can be a, it can be a scary prospect, yeah. getting involved and, and being involved in the criminal justice process, but we absolutely need it to make, to make our community safer. Right. And so I, I always try to leave that thought with folks, is, is we, we really depend on you. We, we're here to help, and that's why the police department is here, that's why the sheriff's office is here, and that's why the district attorney's office is here. Right. But we need that initial call, that initial report to start that investigation. Yeah, uh, we're just honored to have him on the show. Yeah. He, he's he's really added some some great information, provides some great information to the viewers. He's a guy that's tough on crime, right. yet he understands and can articulate some compassion under certain circumstances. But you know, just doing a great job in Jefferson County. We're very excited. Yeah, appreciate to have you on the show. It. Thank you so much. Appreciate the time. Great show. Thanks you for to you as well. Appreciate you being with us. Here's how you can continue to contact the firm at Paulus Wright and Couch. Find them on Facebook and Twitter as well. Appreciate the time. Look forward to seeing you next time right here on The Attorneys. Thanks for watching The Attorneys, sponsored by the law firm of Hollis Wright & Couch.